Hey, buddy. It's technically 801. Had a slight technical malfunction, but we are back. Um, so welcome to working at the top of license, um, and we're going to get great information today on how to reallocate work among a team. So we definitely want to hear from you during the presentation today. There's time set aside um, at the end to take questions, and then also throughout the um, presentation, there'll be opportunities for you to participate in polls or maybe chat in some ideas you have. So make sure you stay attuned and alert um, for those opportunities. Um, you can send your questions in throughout the presentation. No need to wait until Q&A starts. Just start sending them in as they come up. <laughs> and you can type those into the questions pane in the GoToWebinar control panel. So. Um, this uh, webinar is hosted through the Patient Center Primary Care Institute, which is a partnership that was launched in 2012 with the support of the Oregon Health Authority PCPCH program and managed by, <laughs> by QCOR. Um, <coughs> excuse me. We partner with experts um, to get technical assistance resources to primary care practices working on the medical home, or PCPCH, um, as it's known in Oregon, model of care. Uh, you can visit our website for more information, and you can access online modules, recordings of webinars like this one, and information about our other work. As I said, a key partner for the Institute is the PCPCH program. The PCPCH program model of care is defined by six core attributes, and underneath each of those attributes, there are specific standards and measures that practices attest to in order to become recognized as primary care homes by the state. Uh, you can learn more about the PCPCH program on their website at primarycarehome.oregon.gov. And I am so very pleased um, to introduce Alicia Miller, who's our webinar presenter today. She brings a solid combination of clinical and operational expertise to medical home programs. As a prior nurse manager for primary care at Benton County, Alicia solidified her deep knowledge of clinic operations in a medical home environment. At Care Oregon, as a primary care innovation specialist, she provides technical assistance and process improvement support to primary care clinics in the Columbia Pacific and Yamhill County Coordinated Care Organization. So we're so very pleased to have um, Alicia share her wisdom and her experience with us today. She is joined by Scott Zalman, who is a population health supervisor at Care Oregon. He's been at Care Oregon for a short one and a half months, but prior to that, he spent seven years at a community health center as a medical assistant, lead medical assistant, medical assistant supervisor, and an OCEAN EHR site specialist. He has been a part of large health systems, private practice, and community health centers in many different roles, from support to administrative. So we are in excellent hands today, and I'll go ahead and turn things over to Scott and Alicia. All right, thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. We are really excited to be able to talk about this topic. And again, we definitely welcome questions, so you can feel free to type them in as we go through. And hopefully, we'll have time at the end to get to them all. Just to do a reminder of our objectives is to define the boundaries around top of license work allocation, uh, explore the challenges associated with reallocating work and changing work among the team. I'm sure if uh, anyone out there has tried to do this work, you already know from experience that it is not easy. You cannot just say, go forth and do. Uh, we also want to discuss the leadership strategies for anticipating and responding to change. To the changes, because leadership support is also really, really important, which again, we'll talk, we'll talk about later. And we have some tools that, and activities to, that we can touch on today that we're hoping that you can take back to your teams and back to your clinics. And I use them in real life and help start this work if you haven't started it already. So just to do an overview, kind of a repetition from what Kate covered, but um, we're talking about the basic medical home concepts, engage leadership, empanelment, care team development, care coordination, and strategic use of data. When we go in and start working with clinics, these are some of the key factors that we look for and talk about in our, in our learning collaboratives we really touch on. So today we are going to have this base 
in the care team development portion of it. And I wanted to start with this slide. And this is a great slide that I have used in many different presentations. And if you can look at it, and the top line is uh, all about the different types of work. Again, this is not an exhaustive list, but different types of work that gets done and how it all has to funnel through the provider and then goes out to the different uh, specialists or team members in the clinic. And this, this uh, slide always <laughs> reminds me of sort of the, the sand time clock, and it makes me think of a provider that's sort of on a countdown to burnout. So this is the old way of doing things, right? Hopefully there's, there's a lot of clinics that still do it. So just to sort of hone in more on this, if, that, if we're practicing in that type of an environment, here is a study that was done to calculate how many hours do you actually need to provide care in that, type, in that mechanism of practice. And if you can look, uh, if you see on the screen, it's almost 18 hours, and that is per patient. So if you do all of the preventative care and all of the evidence-based care, again, that's 18 hours per patient for one provider to try to coordinate and, and do for everybody. Again, the provider burnout comes to mind. So we're hoping to talk today about the team-based care. So how do you get the, the provider is not in that burnout mode and the provider is not the center of everything? And in the team-based care model, this is just an example of different uh, roles that can make up the, the care team. And really remembering that the patient is at the center of it, not necessarily the provider. No disrespect to any providers out there, but we really want to keep our, our interactions team-based team and patient-centered so that we can achieve this, right? We really want to take it so that the, the provider is not the center, the patient is the center, and that the work is better distributed across the different team members. And really utilizing the team members to the top of their skill set. So making sure that you, that you have a behaviorist. If you have a behaviorist, that you know how to use them. And putting the infrastructure in place so that this model of work can actually be successful. So I want to take a second and do a poll just to find out more information from the folks on the call and the webinar to find out where exactly do you think your clinics are at. So on a scale of 1 to 10, where do you think your, current, your clinic currently is? Um, are you the picture A, where everything is still funneled through the provider, so that would be a 1? Or are you more like the situation B, where the work is better assigned, the provider is an equal team member, you have infrastructure in place so that, um, so that folks can work at the top of their skill set. So go ahead and just take about 20 seconds or so, and if you can vote, that would be great. All right, this is, uh, this is Kay. We just have a couple people struggling out there to answer the poll question, so get your answer in because we're going to close the poll in just a couple of seconds. And here are the results. Wonderful. Okay, so it looks like we have a lot of folks that are starting on this work or are sort of in the middle to this work, and some folks that are really making a lot of progress um, in the 7 to 8 range. So that's great. And um, we wanted to, Scott and I wanted to find out a little bit more about who was on the phone so that we can try to better address where the clinics are and their, their journey on this um, with the content that we're going to talk about. So let me try to, um, let's see. <laughs> okay, hold on one second, I'm having a heart. That's okay, it's always a little tricky to get the slides going after a poll there. Um, there you go. Okay, there we go. I think we are good to go. Okay, 
So what do we do with all of this work, right? Because the work isn't changing. In fact, with all of the different metrics and with the different reporting bodies that people have, that folks have to report to, the work isn't changing. So how many folks feel like this at the end of the day? Or at the beginning of the day, I suppose, <laughs> knowing that it's the big, especially at the beginning of the week. So our goal is to try to get away from that. So how do we do it? Using our team members. Let's get caught up. There we go. Okay, so this is sort of touching on the leadership portion just a little bit. So making sure to remind folks how important it is to do this process with your staff. If three leaders sit in a room and go through the exercises that we're going to talk about, um, I can guarantee you that A, some work is going to be missed, that, and B, that, again, the staff isn't going to, you're probably going to encounter a lot of resistance and, and probably not a lot of engagement. So with your staff, or have the staff lead themselves, I guess. You can actually just be a bystander and watch how the process goes. Assess the current work that's being done, as well as the work that still needs to be done. And, and also, is the most appropriate staff member doing the work? Uh, the second bullet under that I love. Are the providers hunting down medical records? Because I cannot tell you how many times when I've gone into a clinic and sat down with providers one-on-one -on -one to kind of hear their side of the story, feel, hear where they think the clinic is. And I hear this over and over from the providers. But I'm so tired of taking 15 minutes of my 20-minute visit to try to figure out what happened when they went to the ER three days ago or what happened when they were inpatient in the hospital and now I'm supposed to do the follow-up and I have no idea what's going on. And I'm the one that's running around trying to get the records. And then also involving the staff in the re reallocation of the work. A lot of times they are more creative than you, anyone can possibly imagine. And to encourage really thinking outside of the box, problem solving, because maybe there's a really quiet person at the front desk that is really engaged and really bored with just checking people in and answering the phone, and that person would love to be more involved, and maybe that is the perfect person to be hunting down the medical records. So these are some tools that we have done, uh, we have used in clinics, and that has actually really helped them to take the time to look at their work and look at their processes and start to make some significant progress on reallocating the work across the team. So this is, and it doesn't have to be this grand tool. We actually have some pretty um, interesting involving tools that we'll talk about next. But this is, I did this with one of the clinics, actually down in Yamhill. And all we used for this tool was a whiteboard and some blue painter's tape. And we had them go through the work that they felt was the most important. And we taught, had them go, th go through the um, who is currently doing the work. Do they, do they have to do the work? Are there other team members that could do the work? And then what do they need to achieve the change? So the leaders allowed them to take two hours and uh, locked them in a room and said, we want your feedback. And they went through this, and they actually came up with some really creative ways of how to reallocate the work. And then they actually went through and trialed it. They ended up making tweaking, tweaking it and all that, but um, they, did, they used the PDSA process. And again, it was not a fancy tool. Uh-oh. Kate, can you help me? Yeah, you should be good now. OK, good, thank you. OK, so this is a more involved tool that, um, again, we have used and it's been used in large clinic systems. Uh, it was actually used at Multnomah County. Uh, we had we started to use it in clinic in smaller clinic systems with just um, three to eight providers, and it was a little trickier in a smaller system, but it's a great place to start again. We took some of the work and grouped it together in, um, in what is team based what it looks like doing team based care, and we handed it out to the staff members themselves, and they filled it out themselves. 
so that they could, they could really reflect on what they're doing, is it what they want to do, and it was a safe way to report. Uh, and I've been in a lot of meetings where there's a lot of quiet people that don't necessarily speak up, but if you give them a tool that they can fill out and hand in, you get a world of feedback. So they score themselves in all of these different areas. And this tool will be available after the webinar because it's actually a six page, six to seven page tool and there's several steps to it, so I'm just going to touch on it here. And I also want to acknowledge that, the, that this was adapted from the University of Washington Impact Program and we tweaked it a little bit to um, be more primary care team based. So here's an example of, um, of, of scoring this. And if you notice, uh, under staff one is the PCP, staff two is the MA, and staff three is the front desk. And if you look at the PCP line, they're doing a lot of the work. They're doing a lot, they're doing several proactive work functions. They're doing also a lot of the team supporting functions. And, and again, the question comes to mind, are they the most appropriate person to be doing this? And the MA is doing some things, but not very much, and the front desk person um, is not very engaged in the, in the work. They're, they're just sort of acting in the minimum front, front, uh, front desk capacity. So this is another activity that we, um, we we work very closely here at Care Oregon with the University of San Francisco Centers for Excellence in Primary Care. And this is an activity that they use that we've also started to use in, with our teams. And it's called Share the Care. And again, as leaders, you really need to allow your staff time out of clinic in order to do these activities. Um, but the benefits that you'll reap from it are, are worth the time out of clinic. So it's not, um, you got to love cell phone cams, but, so it's not the clearest picture. But on the far left column is the uh, primary care provider, and then the registered nurse, MA, front office, and then there's a nobody column, and a behaviorist column. And again, this is just what, what was applicable to this clinic. You can adapt the roles for whatever clinic you're going into. Um, or whatever, whatever roles you have in your clinic. So if you have a pharmacist, you can add them. You can expand this and make it more columns. You can adapt the tool to whatever you need to accomplish your goal in your specific clinic. So we, they filled this out, and we had them brainstorm and really think outside the box around, is this the most appropriate person doing it? Is there a way that we could redistribute this work and really start to address what work is not being done. Because what's in that nobody column is a lot of the proactive work, and a lot of the panel management work, all of that kind of team-based function were not getting done because the clinic was not functioning. They, they claimed they had teams, but they weren't actually functioning as a team. So this is how they, what they came up with afterwards. And so if you notice, the primary care team, the primary care provider is much less. The nobody column is now empty. And I think if we had challenged them a little bit more, they probably could have even shifted more to the behaviorist role, um, as well as this is perhaps this wasn't an, an exhaustive list, and there, it, it could have been um, better distributed as well. But again, a really solid tool that you can do in your clinic with your staff to achieve the reallocation of work. But in order to do this, let me go back to this one. Um, again, you really need leadership support. So once you've done that, um, this is sort of for the, this is more for the clinics that are, we're in the middle category that have teams that are uh, doing, maybe you're doing already the basics of panel management. This is a slide that is more around population stratification. So if you have your teams, um, if you have your panels, but maybe you're stuck, maybe you can't get everything out of the provider's hands, the provider's hands, and you know that there's some gaps in care that, and some folks that are being missed, this is a tool to, to look at those different functions. 
So first we have panel management. Again, the proactive work, work that's being done, outreach for the woman that's Mr. Mammogram, outreach for the folks that really need their colorectal cancer screening, and maybe the kiddos are late for their vaccines. Uh, this is the different types of gaps in care that apply to the entire panel for a provider. Then you start to move up a level in complexity and really um, really doing some more stratification of your population and what do the folks that are kind of in the middle, they have a chronic disease, maybe it's a new diagnosis, they, they need a little bit of help, a little bit more than your average healthy 21-year-old female that's going to come in for her yearly annual. So some self-management support, medication management, and again, part of this exercise is figuring out what goes in that green box for your specific organization. And then you have your complex case management folks. These are your really high risk, really high utilizers, and coming up with a, a, a strategy for how do you really engage those folks. And again, this is going to be an even smaller subset of your panel that um, is just receiving the regular panel management for us. That's a, the level one. So at, when I was working at the community health centers of Benton and Lynn counties, I worked very closely with another manager there, Kelly Bolson, and together we, we started really trying to dive into this. We, at how do, and we were trying to pair, how do we look at the pairing of work, or rather the stratification of work, between a health navigator, uh, which is a community uh, outreach worker, and a clinical case manager who is typically an RN. And so we started to use this as a visualization for us that helped us start to decide how do we split the work between that specific pairing. And then we dove a little bit deeper and uh, we focused uh, more in on a specific diagnosis. And so this is what we developed around um, diabetes and diabetes care. And again, balancing what was safe and um, appropriate to go to a community health worker and what was safe and what was appropriate to go to the RN, but really elevating the practices in both of them, both of those roles. And this was also something that we used as a training tool to help the staff understand what we were looking for, as well as our leadership to understand where we were trying to take the program. And we used this slide a lot for trainings uh, and for trying to get folks on board with, with reallocating the work and with utilizing team members to their highest capabilities. So top of license work, what does that look like and what does that mean? So before we go further, I just want to say that um, by no means are we legal experts in this room. <laughs> and I um, fully encourage you guys, if you have specific practice questions, to, to talk with the certifying board for those folks because the scope of a pharmacist could be very broad. Again, but I would definitely check with uh, the pharmacy board. So this was one way that we interpreted the um, nursing practice from the Oregon State Board of Nursing. And really diving into what is top of license for work for MMA, an LPN, and an RN. And there's not very many LPNs out there, but there were there are enough clinics that we work with that have them that we felt that it was still valuable to include this in our um, in our interpretation work that we've been doing. And again, if you can see, this is very sort of low-level interpretation, if you will. This is what we've encouraged clinics to build their practices on, because this is where you still need a lot of infrastructure, but you need the infrastructure to function and be built within the correct licensure. So again, you cannot have a nursing, a nurse, a registered nurse out there diagnosing, but you can build policies and procedures and standing protocols in a way that a nurse a registered nurse can do a very high level visit. And also you can build standing protocols and strategies of care that allow an MA to function at a very high level without stepping out of the bounds safely. 
So these are just some resources that, again, if you're looking at nursing visits, which we've encountered in um, several different, not only clinics, but CCOs, that they are really starting to look at the nursing practice and how can they use that, use the nursing practice to offload work from a provider. And so these are some great resources that can uh, provide more information on ways to do that that are safe and that are functioning within the bounds according to the Board of Nursing. So leaders, I love this picture. Be the kind of leader that you would follow because I think we lose access of that. Having led this work, having worked with different leaders at all different levels because you can have your unofficial leaders in the clinic you can have your official leaders and your managers, and you can have your official executive leaders that are at what we call the C-level, the chief executive officers and the chief financial officers. And no matter what the role is in the clinic, making sure that you stay on track and making sure that you're leading in a way that is going to engage your staff. You don't want to alienate your staff because remember, if no one's following you, you're not really a leader. And even if it just means being there, this, you know, we, we go through these slides pretty quickly, talk about the activities really quickly, but this work is really hard work and it takes a long time. And I was at a training one time and one of the chief executive officers was talking about their personal experience in a large clinic system where they went through this change and they talked, they were very um, honest about all of the turmoil that they were going through or had gone through and how they didn't really, they felt like they were still finding their way, but they were there for their staff. And so they made a, they were, they made a commitment to walk through every single clinic at least once every single week. And the way that that engaged the staff gave the staff confidence in the work that they were doing and in the change. And the leaders all of a sudden became on the same level as the staff doing the work. And it wasn't um, this work that was being handed down. And I just thought that was, I've always thought that that's a really powerful statement. And when I've encouraged leaders to do that in the clinics that I've coached, the, way, the transition in attitude that I've seen in their staff is always astounding to me because, you know, a lot of times the leaders are hesitant to do this because they say to me, well, I don't, I don't have all the answers. I'm going to get all these questions and I'm not going to have the answers. And, and I remind them that nobody has these answers. And it's really, you might get really great questions that lead to the answer. But don't be afraid to say, I don't know, we're doing this together. Which kind of goes to this next slide, collaborating with the staff for the process. You know, really engaging them in the pre-work to these exercises and hearing from the staff before you even start this process about why is it important to the clinical staff and how can they benefit from this. And identifying your clinical leaders is key. And again, it doesn't have to be an official leader. It's, um, it can also be an unofficial leader. Because when you're in these meetings and you have these conversations, there's probably some conversations that happen outside of those meeting rooms. And to have champions, to have folks that can really carry forth the cause is really very key. And again, to just remind folks to, to be the bridge, help them bridge. This is not something where you can do the exercise one day you're going to try it next week, get it right, and therefore it is done. This work takes a lot of time, writing the standing protocols, supporting the staff, getting everybody on board, doing it one team at a time across the clinic, and leaders really need to help be that bridge. So the infrastructure. So role definition and transformation is very key. Um, again, that can be embedded in this work. Because if you're having them do the share the care exercise and the um, medical assistant has no idea what their true role is, that's, a great, that's great information to know. You can help them step back and maybe they do some role definition work before they start to do the reallocation of work. Uh, standard workflows developed. That's, it's, in order to get providers on board, a lot of times there's a lack of trust. And so you really need to have the providers engaged in developing the standard workflows 
but also ha help them back off a little bit so that the staff feel empowered to function at a higher level under those standard workflows. And again, inclusion of team members that are not typically thought of as team members, the medical records folks, referral coordinators, front desk folks. And there's a lot of people that I've seen a lot of clinics pull in different roles that sometimes even I wouldn't have thought of to be part of the care team. And um, to see the folks flourish and really uh, blossom under this new empowerment that they have is always really, really exciting. So the other message that we have for leaders, <laughs> leadership, whatever, whoever is the quote leader, is you know, be prepared to support the work. If you say, if you let them do all of this stuff, but then all the ideas that they come up with, you you send, you know, no, that's not what we were thinking, that's not what we were needing, you know, no, that's not what we want. I call it wrong rock syndrome. If you give them enough of, of authority to go out and, and, and autonomy to go out and do this work, and then they bring it back and you say, no, that's not right, go out and try again. And if you do that enough times, they brought back the wrong rock, and they just stop bringing back rocks, and you've lost your staff. So you really need to help them, help support them doing this work. One of the biggest ones that I want to emphasize, and Scott, I don't know, you might be touching on this in your portion as well, is the training. And if I'm a nurse that's been doing triage phone calls for the last 15 years, and I'm very happy there, and all of a sudden you come to me and say, hey, wonderful nurse, you are now going to be doing independent visits for brand new hypertensive hypertensive patients, you know, I might not be comfortable with that. I might need some more training into exactly what does that mean? What do I have to do in the visit? I actually have to see the patient face to face. I've not done that in a long time. And so really being prepared to go slow with your staff and upskill them and connect them with enough training and resources so that they do feel comfortable when you launch something like that. I have seen clinics do it wrong and I have seen nurses quit. So it is not an easy process, and again, you really have to be committed to um, take the clinic through this process with the clinic. And again, incorporate the commitment and try the leadership. You kind of have to change your hiring process. How we used to hire when we were looking for a hard set of skills is very different than when you're hiring looking for a, a, somebody who's competent in their roles but also has that soft set of skills, as I call it, where they can, um, they can be engaging. They want to be part of the team member. They really do fit. So not just check the box that they know how to do A through C, but that they know how to, a through, to do A through C, but they also are really, they want to be engaged in this process and really committed in themselves to bettering patient care, functioning as a team, thinking outside the box, because this work is iterative. Just when you think you're done with empanelment, all of a sudden you're back to, oh my gosh, no one's looked at panels in six months, so we really should probably do that again. And getting standards in place for that can be really hard. So making sure that you have, you're hiring the right person in lots of different aspects. Because once you start to try and change your culture, you want to make sure that new folks coming into your culture are going to be supportive of that culture rather than try to, they can, they can kind of throw the culture off and then you go back a few steps. So on that note, I am going to throw this to Scott, who has a lot of lived experience with this at, at, as a MA as a staff member as well as a, as a leader, and let him talk about the culture shift. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to just say good morning to everybody and thanks for, for participating. Um, so I'll give you a little background on myself. So it, into the community health center world about almost eight years ago now. I started as just an entry level MA. Um, I got hired to open up a new clinic um, and very confused, very in this, uh, if you can remember from the beginning of the slide, some of these um, very provider driven environments. And so just trying to find my place coming into this as, as somebody with a background of, you know, some traditional medical assistant skills, somebody that I've worked in hospitals, I've worked in ER, so I, I felt like I had a good background, but um, there was definitely something missing. Um, so when we talk about 
a cultural shift, and I'll back up just a little bit here, that um, when we talk about a culture, we, uh, you're going to have people in your organizations that have been there for a long time. You're going to have people that are, have been there maybe for a short time, and then you're going to have some people that have been there or are fairly new to this environment. And so working with how do we mesh all of that together to change this culture inside of our organization, it's, it can be tough, it can be difficult, it can be rough. And it's, and it's and kind of what Alicia touched on is it really does start with the leadership. Um, when you have a good um, leadership, a good um, group that wants to support this work and a good vision and a good mission for the organization, it's really going to carry down to the staff that are doing this work. Um, when we're looking at changing this kind of model of care, when we go to patient-centeredness, how, if you can remember, maybe 10 years ago, the patient really wasn't at the center of a lot of this care. The patient showed up, they were roomed, their vitals were taken, they were told what to do, and they left the office visit, a lot of times with a lot of questions, a lot of misunderstanding, a lot of opportunities were missed for education and teaching. Um, and so they would go home, um, they would feel frustrated with their care, they wouldn't understand with how things were going. And so now we shift to this new model of care that um, it's, it's patient-centered. The patient is there, you have all these members of a team around them, supporting them, helping them learn and grow throughout this experience. Um, one of the other things is a commitment to this model. Um, I mentioned earlier, it, it'll be rough at times. You're going to have staff that are going to have opinions on how they want it done. You're going to have people that are going to say that it's the, not the right direction. Um, I encourage you to ride that wave because this is definitely a model that has been proven and is successful. Um, so work with your staff on these things. Um, help grow that trust in the team members, help grow, help foster. Um, there's going to be many, many opportunities to help uh, the teams function, help the teams learn and grow together. Um, and when we start looking at the team environment, you're going to have many opportunities to uh, reallocate this work. And when I talk about that, it's, it's a lot of it is more of an upskilling of, upskilling of talents and abilities. Alicia kind of touched on this earlier that, you know, a lot of people come into an organization with a, a, a definite skill set. Um, people come out of school with, you know, I know how to take vitals, I know how to room patients, I know how to, you know, do these certain things in my role in this organization. And it goes from not only the front, but it goes all the way to the back of your organization, from the people that check them in, from if you have a pharmacy in your building, or if you have behaviorists, or if you have medical assistants or nurses. Um, a lot of them are really set in their ways and they know how they feel like this work should be done and this is what they're doing because they've never been told different. They don't understand the, the big picture, the vision, or the, the goals of the organization. And so when we start talking about this shift, there's a lot of upskilling that is involved in this. Um, so looking at how work can be done differently to go back to that first bullet point there to make the patient the center of the care. Um, so as a medical assistant um, in the community health center, we had we went through this uh, transformation from you know more of a private practice model into this patient-centered model, and we started looking at these non-traditional roles that people were going to be playing in this environment. And it wasn't just you know I could take vital signs, I knew how to do a blood pressure and a temperature and check your weight and height and add some stuff in the computer. It was a lot more than that. It was a lot more about involving these these members of the team in the care that is being given to these patients. And so when we talk about these non-traditional types of skills, we talk about motivational interviewing, we talk about goal setting, we talk about an advanced knowledge and understanding of, of how things are working. Um, we talk about you know health maintenance and understanding that a little better as as the roles start to change, and then building on that internally as an organization and helping people understand that and helping people grow and learn, and and this is where really the culture shift starts to change. It's not just I show up and do X, Y, and Z. I now have the opportunity to go into my job, and I feel like I have some tools that are going to make me successful. I feel like I have some resources around me to be successful in 
adding this value to the, to the patient and inside of their visit. Um, and again, Alicia touched on this and I'll just touch on it again. It definitely does come from leadership support and there has to be time built in for clinics and people involved in this to make this kind of change. Um, if, if it's coming from the top down and people are not involved, this will not be successful. Um, you need to get buy-in at the entry level. And Alicia also stole a lot of my material. <laughs> so um, it, it, it does start with the hiring process too. You do want these people coming into your organization that have some of those soft skills, but are also going to be willing to learn and to grow inside of the organization. Um, when we start talking about some of these other non-traditional roles, it's not just I'm here to do this and then I go home. It's I'm here to do this and more, and I can see the benefit of that as we start to change this culture as an organization. Sorry, Scott, I didn't mean to. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> and oh, I'll just say one other thing. Um, as I think about this, these clinics that are going through this, you, ha you, um, you should be comforted in the fact that, that you guys are not alone, you guys are not singled out. This is something that is widespread through all organizations, from big hospital systems to private practice to community health centers to specialist offices. These are things that are talked about. These are things that are experienced every day inside of these, these uh, organizations. They're really trying to figure out how to be more productive, get more out of their employees. Um, employee satisfaction is, is huge, and, and a lot of it changes in the culture that's going on. The other thing, this is Alicia again, that I just wanted to add is that this um, share the care activity, the reallocation of work activities, I went in working with clinics, I have done them at every level within this clinic. So I have helped, we have helped facilitate meetings between um, where the leadership is part of the process and I'm the facilitator guiding them through it. I have facilitated this just with the leadership because sometimes at the leadership level there's so much work to be done and nobody knows who's doing what. And so this activity can be tweaked to be done at the leadership level as well so that the leadership feels like they really have a grasp on what their job is, what their work is, so that they can then guide their staff through the same process. Uh, uh, one other thing, this is Scott, and I wanted to mention. Um, so the second to the bottom bullet point there, the communication piece between the teams and members. This is not something that is among the teams only. This is something that needs to go from the top to the bottom of the organization. Um, a lot of times you have teams kind of doing their own thing and other teams working on other things, and so it can get really confusing and discombobulated at times. So being on the same page as an organization and, and understanding really what's going on and being that resource for the teams that are involved in this change that you can say this team is working on this and this is the success that they found in doing this. What can you guys do differently to impact the work that you're doing based on that or what are you guys doing that can find that other teams may benefit from. And so it's not a lot of duplication of work. It's really a communication strategy to understand what the organization and where people are headed. So now that we've gone through a lot of information in a very short period of time, uh, I would be very interested to hear from the clinics that are on the, participating in the webinar if this has sparked any next steps for your organization and if any of the clinics on the call have participated in a Care Oregon Collaborative, you know that we very rarely let you sit down and we keep you, try to keep you highly involved in walking around the room. And so in the, I'd like to tweet, try to take that a little bit and do this through the webinar. So if you want to take just a couple seconds and think about um, what are some next steps for reallocating work within your organization, even um, at the clinical level perhaps, maybe at the leadership level, um, what, but, but what are some solid next steps that you, that you can per, help facilitate and move forward in your organization from the information that we talked about today. And then I um, will hand it back to Kate for the questions. I think we still have some time for, for questions. We sure do. So this is Kate again. Um, if you would like to type your questions into the GoToWebinar control panel, um, I will be able to read them to Alicia. Um, you can also, if you want to just type in and tell us what your next steps are, they may help motivate someone else, so feel free to do that as well. 
We did get a couple of questions throughout the presentation, so we'll use those to kick us off. Alicia, could you talk a little bit about, there are a lot of health plans or CCOs who have um, folks doing care management and care coordination. Um, how do you think about that when you think about reallocating work among a team? And have you seen any examples where people have really, um, you know, we've heard that maybe that can be duplicative sometimes or sometimes that can get confusing for a patient. Have you heard of any situations where um, folks have really figured out how to leverage that resource into their team? That is a great question, and it's actually something that um, I'll be very transparent. We struggled with here at Care Oregon, and we got a lot of feedback from our members that it's really confusing because I get out of the hospital and I'm all confused because you know, life is incredibly different. I just had a major life shift, and then I have this one person calling me, and I don't know who they are or where they're from, and then I have another person calling me, and now I'm frustrated that I have two people calling me for the same purpose. And we um, really listened to that feedback, and we, tr we, uh, we definitely tried to be strategic internally about communicating who, to our care management folks which clinics were doing what. Now, in a smaller system like Columbia Pacific CCO or Yamho CCO, it's much easier to, to go clinic by clinic and figure out which clinic is doing what. Um, in a larger area like the uh, metro region, it is a little bit more difficult, and I think it is really tricky to figure out that um, duplication. So I would just encourage conversation, a lot of conversation between the, the payers and the clinics themselves. So if there's a way that um, the care management manager can, you know, if there's a, so if, I'll just use a real example. What we did is we have the learning collaboratives in the different CCOs, and so we brought our internal care management staff to those learning collaboratives with, that have a solid representation of the clinics throughout their region, and let them um, talk to each other to figure out who is doing what? First of all, who's doing what? And then the next question was, which is more beneficial for the patient? Is it more beneficial for the patient to have the provider's office call? Or is it their PCP call? Or is it more beneficial for the plan, maybe the PCP office doesn't have time to do it, and, it, and the plan can do it? And then you need to come up with a communication strategy. How does the care management staff at the plan communicate to the primary care provider that this is going on. And I think it's a little bit different region by region, but I really encourage some open, very honest conversations to figure out you know, the best way to not duplicate work. That is a um, good suggestion, and thanks for the honesty about how it's, it's still a challenge. I think many out there are challenged uh, in the same way. So Karen, if you have any follow-up questions to that response, please do write them in, and I'd be happy to put those forward um, to Alicia as well. So um, a couple of other questions came in, and they're somewhat related. Um, so I'm just going to kind of mush them together. Um, one person wanted to know, how do you hire for sort of the you know, soft skills related to teamwork, um, especially um, this person um, who's asking is in a, a small rural area, so there's a limited pool of folks to draw from, and has a very small team. She's um, an amazing PA in Moffin named Sharon DeHart. Um, so she has a very <laughs> small staff, team of four. Um, how can she hire people who can really, um, who can really adapt in this model well? And the secondary question is, in these rural communities or small practices where they're very small teams, and really the whole clinic is one team, is any of this relevant for them? You know, and how, how is it different than maybe some of the bigger teams that have used these tools? Great questions again. So definitely in the rural areas, it is harder to, um, you don't have as large a pool, and a lot of the clinics that I work with that um, have that, they have that same struggle. And so then it really, it kind of transfers to within your organization, how, is there a way to grow the staff that you have to have those skills? And, and also, you know, if you, if you 
can, if you have the ability, I don't know this clinic very well, so my apologies, but um, if you have the ability to still be a little selective with the folks that you, you are able to interview or if there's the potential for growth in a candidate, then I think that that is the soft skill that you're looking for. So internally, how do you build the infrastructure? How do you work with the folks that you currently have and really do some motivating, really do um, some support strategies, which is a lot, which a lot of times is based more individually on staff because the way you support and empower and encourage one staff member might look completely different than how you support and encourage another staff member. But there, if you can focus on the internal culture with the folks that you already have in your really small clinic, then I think that that would be a great place to start. And this isn't something, again, that happens over a very short period of time. And, and if you can get a couple of the folks in your staff on board, then a lot of times the one, the folks, the one person or a couple people that are your holder outers, if you will, they usually end up kind of succumbing and getting more on board with this practice model. Um, but it does take a lot of time and it does take a lot of reminders and continuing support. And in regards to the whole, the, the size of the clinic, um, honestly, sometimes this work is easier accomplished with a smaller clinic than a larger clinic. So this, is, this model of care is incredibly applicable to all different sizes of clinics and how you, how the clinic decides to share the care and share the responsibilities might look very different than a larger clinic system, but it is still really possible. And, and maybe I can find this uh, link, and Kate, I can send it to you and you can send it out to the group, but it's about this really small, incredibly rural clinic out in, I think, southern Colorado, um, south, south Eastern Colorado, and they have folks rotating through there. They're dealing with turnover all the time, but it's about how they've used folks, they've used local individuals to really, um, and really empowered them and the, the, the anchors in, those clin in that clinic are actually unlicensed community health workers that the clinic has empowered and grown. And so I can try to find that link and send it out to you, Kate. That would be excellent. Um, there was another um, question that came in about how do you get um, physicians or clinicians um, to give up some of their duties or that's what it might feel like um, or feel like they can let go of some of the tasks that they have done for so long and still feel comfortable that they're getting done appropriately. That is the million dollar question. Um, so I'll speak to it a little bit and then Scott, maybe you can address part of this too. Um, in my experience and in the feedback that I've gotten from the clinics that I've worked with is it, and from the providers, is it truly is about trust. If the, a lot of times the providers are kind of hoarding their work, if you will, because they don't trust that their MA is going to do what they say they're going to do, or they don't trust that the nurse has the proper training, or they have no idea what a community health worker can do, or they don't even know Sally at the front desk, or, you know, the, and so it's really facilitating and helping the clinician to build trust in their team members, and then the team members are really, they really have to follow through. So if the clinician says, okay, I am now going to let the our referral coordinator call all of the folks with normal lab results so that I no longer have to call every single normal lab result, then that person really needs to call every single person. And in the beginning, maybe even report back to the provider. It's truly a step-by-step -step process. Scott, you've lived a lot of that, so maybe you have something to add. Yeah, so one thing I'll just add to that is as much as you can involve the provider in that, the more successful it will be. Um, at one of the clinics that I worked at, we had some of the providers that had trouble letting go of some of this stuff, the work, um, and 
and it was more of a upskilling for the medical assistants. So it was an opportunity for not only the medical assistants to learn and grow, but it was also an opportunity for the providers to let go of some of that work. And it had to do a lot with, you know, diabetic foot exams, and it had to do with um, teaching the staff how to do ABIs, ankle brachial indexes, which is a way to check for good um, pulses in the leg. Uh, so there's things that you could teach the staff um, coming from a provider, um, and it's going to help them see and understand the work that's being done, and they're going to feel comfortable with the way it was taught because it came from them. And then, again, and I'll just touch on what Alicia said, is it's that follow-up piece that's important. It's, it's the talking about it. It's the checking it off, making it part of their skill set, um, and it's visualized. And so the provider feels comfortable with letting go of that work and that, they're, and that the work is actually getting done. All right, excellent. So anybody who's had um, other questions, we have about three minutes left, so we could probably take one more. Or if there are any um, follow-up questions to one of the ones um, the, uh, that have already been asked. Oh, here's one. Um, and then just really quickly before I do this last question, um, folks have asked if the webinar slides are going to be available. And they are. And so are the tools that have been discussed during the webinar. and a recording of this webinar so that you can share it with team members who couldn't be here today. All of that will be posted to the Institute website by the end of today, and you'll get an email um, as a registered attendee letting you know um, and reminding you that it's there as well. Um, so the question that came in is, how are others getting around non-certified NAs and lab entries when no RN or other licensed individual other than the provider um, and she said, also, we do not qualify for meaningful use. So I don't know if we need to clarify that, Alicia, or if you kind of understand where that question is headed. I know you're not a credentials expert. <laughs> you gave that disclaimer. But can you talk a little bit about that? Um, I think a little more clarification would be good. But just on my brief understanding of the question, I would say, um, if there's a question about if somebody or some, if, if somebody can do something, if there's a way for the legwork to be done by a team member so that the provider simply has to sign off on it to try just to try and decrease maybe one step for the provider, it might still result in less work for the provider. So if the provider is resulting a lab, and, you know, typing it, doing the data entry of a lab result and signing off on it. If you can have a team member do the data entry part um, and, and just send the lab result. I don't know that I understand the question, though. I think, I think that that um, sort of gets, gets at it. And maybe there's some follow-up that we can do after this morning um, webinar by email to kind of clarify that, that piece. So, we will get um, back in touch with you, questioner. And with that, we are at 9. And I know that folks have things to um, get back to in their day. So we're going to end the webinar. But um, we want to thank you all for participating. And please complete the webinar survey that pop up, pops up on your screen as you exit GoToWebinar. Um, the feedback really helps us in planning future webinars. Uh, we read it, and we will pass it along to Alicia and Scott. I want to thank Alicia and Scott for their time today. And um, I think with that, we want to wish everyone a happy rest of your day and week.